A Lined by Writing By Charles Dickens Audiobook 37x73 The trip was to be one of his outs writ large, commensurate in scale with the, with the twenty months of sustained intensive work that had preceded it. Moreover, Dickens, who had, he confided to Burdett Coutts on September 18, vague Swiss notions in his mind, also wanted, as he put it, to look about me, his usual phrase for checking out local colour. Evidently, he was thinking of setting part, at least, of his next novel in Switzerland. Having dwelt so long and so intensely on the romantic side of familiar things he was now perhaps thinking of using a contrasting, more traditional, romantic setting, rather as he had contemplated using wild and desolate Cornish scenery eleven years before. Financial considerations, however, were to cut across any such intentions if he had them. Not only would the setting of his next story be very different from Switzerland, though to many of his readers it perhaps seemed almost as exotic, but also the very format of the story, and hence its mode of reception by readers, would be quite different from the one he had been working with so successfully for the past ten years. Chapter 16 Writing for these times 1853-1854 To interest and affect the general mind in behalf of anything that is clearly wrong to stimulate and rouse the public soul to a compassionate or indignant feeling that it must not be. Without obtruding any pet theory of cause or cure, and so throwing off allies as they spring up. I believe to be one of fiction's highest uses. And this is the use to which I try to turn it. Dickens to Henry Carey, August 24, 1854 FF Rom Paris where Dickens, Collins and Egg dined with Burdett Coutts, Dickens sent the first of the series of long, gossipy and affectionate letters he wrote to Catherine during his Swiss-slash-Italian excursion, interspersed with similar ones to Georgina. He found Paris as exhilarating as ever and wonderfully improving in appearance with its newly macadamist quaysides and the grand new extension of the Rue de Rivoli. By October 16 the travellers had reached Lausanne where Dickens had a joyous reunion with the Surgats and Haldimand. He also renewed his acquaintance with the Mare de Glace in an adventurous expedition during which, he gleefully reported to Catherine, he was hailed by the guides as an intrepid. From Lausanne the party journeyed on to Milan and Genoa, where Dickens enjoyed more reunions with, amongst others, the Thompsons and the De La Rousse. Catherine was treated to an entertaining description of the Thompsons' disheveled domesticity but for the time being the De La Rousse remained significantly unmentioned. From Genoa the travellers embarked for Naples where they stayed a few days and then, abandoning the idea of crossing to Sicily, proceeded to Rome reaching there on 12 November.1 During this trip Dickens could not, of course, be as closely involved as usual with the day-to-day -day editing of his journal but he sought to keep Wills up to the mark with his solemn and continual conductorial injunction, promulgated on November 17, keep household words imaginative. He was mindful, too, of the need to organize the Christmas number, a second round of stories by the Christmas fire. From Rome he sent Wills the first of his own offerings, the schoolboy story, which, he commented, is in a character that nobody else is likely to hit, and which is pretty sure to be considered pleasant. It Charles Dickens is indeed a heartwarming tale of evil repaid with good, saved from sentimentality by being mediated to us through its convincingly ventriloquist, schoolboy narrator. After a few days in Rome, where Dickens rejoiced especially to observe the electric telegraph wires piercing like a sunbeam through the cruel old heart of the Colosseum, he and his party moved on to first Florence and then Venice. In Venice he wrote Nobody's Story, his second Christmas piece, which was very far from being pleasant. Nobody, the leading character, embodies the vast anonymous mass of the poor but honest, overburdened and endlessly toiling English people and he echoes Joe's confusion when preached at by the missionaries who visit him in his slum dwelling where, he says, every minute of my numbered days is new mire added to the heap under which I lie oppressed. He cannot get his children educated, 
nor the fetid lairs in which they have to live cleansed, neither will the powerful bigwigs who rule him permit him and his family any mental refreshment and recreation or humanizing enjoyments as a relief from the unremitting squalor and harshness of their existence. This last detail looks forward to a central concern of Dickens's next novel Hard Times, but in the main nobody's story reads like a scathing postscript to Bleak House. The pestilence engendered in nobody's slum becomes a deadly miasma threatening the grand homes of the bigwigs, briefly terrifying them into trying to improve his lot but as their fear wore off. They resumed their falling out among themselves, and did nothing. This was certainly a pretty ferocious Christmas offering from Dickens to the English public. The fiercest, in fact, since the chimes, the only previous such offering to have been written in Italy. Point two Dickens felt his touring holiday was doing him good after the long haul of writing Bleak House. I feel that I could not have done a better thing to clear my mind and freshen it up again, than make this expedition, he wrote to Catherine on November 14. He knew, however, that he had to keep on the move. I am so restless to be doing, he wrote to Burdett Couts from Milan on October 25th, and always shall be, I think, so long as I have any portion in time. That if I were to stay more than a week in any one city here, I believe I should be half desperate to begin some new story. For the moment, however, his main literary output was epistolary. In his letters to Catherine, for example, he builds up his traveling companions as a pair of comic characters. They amuse him especially when they discourse on art, color, tone, and so forth. As Pictures from Italy demonstrates, Dickens was a man who knew what he liked when it came to paintings and sculpture. He wanted no guidance from self-appointed experts. To Forster he wrote scornfully, the intolerable nonsense against which genteel taste and subserviency are afraid to rise, in connection with art, is astounding. As to literature, Collins diverted him by expounding a code of morals taken from modern French novels which, Dickens reports to Catherine, I instantly and with becoming gravity smash. Meanwhile he was sending to Forster a number of vivid little travel sketches, writing for these times. 1853 to 1854 among them a hilarious account of some very Hazelwittian sounding Americans making fools of themselves at the Rome Opera, and a powerfully sinister description of the fever haunted desolation of the Roman Campania. Point three from Rome the Dickens party returned to Paris arriving there on December 10. Charlie, who had been studying German with Dickens's European publisher, Baron Tochnitz, in Leipzig with a view to a career in commerce, joined them and they all crossed to England the following day. Dickens wrote his last letter to Catherine from Turin on December 5. It differed from its predecessors in that it was primarily a marital lecture about her attitude towards his involvement with the De La Rue's nine years earlier, and was prompted, presumably by his having seen them again in Genoa. He strongly recommends, it is, he insists, a recommendation not an order, and he will never inquire into whether or not she has acted on it, that Catherine should send Augusta de la Rue a friendly and sympathetic letter. As to his mesmeric treatment of Augusta, Catherine, of all people, should by now have come to understand that the intense pursuit of any idea that takes complete possession of me, is one of the qualities that makes me different. Sometimes for good, sometimes I dare say for evil. From other men, Whatever made you unhappy in the Genoa time had no other root, beginning, middle, or end, than whatever has made you proud and honored in your married life, and given you station better than rank, and surrounded you with many enviable things. This is the plain truth. In the absence of much knowledge of how the relationship between husband and wife actually worked, or failed to work, it is hard to know how Catherine would have felt about receiving such a letter as this which shows Dickens still resentful of the embarrassment he felt she had caused him, she would surely have been greatly hurt had she seen the letter he wrote to Burdett Couts only a few weeks later, blaming her for Charlie's indescribable lassitude of character, claiming this had been 
inherited from her along with tenderer and better qualities. Whatever she may have thought, she did dutifully write to Madame de la Rue.4 on his return to Tavistock House household words and its plummeting circulation figures demanded his attention. Profits had dropped from between £900 and £1,300 per half year to pound 527.15.10 for the same period by the end of September. Dickens at once fell tooth and nail upon the task of editing the extra Christmas number. Also, drawing on his great stock of knowledge of travel literature, a genre for which he had always, Forster tells us, an insatiable relish, he quickly produced another fireside piece, The Long Voyage, somewhat of a scissors and paste job, for the lead article in the New Year's Eve issue. Bradbury and Evans and Wills, clearly felt, however, that to restore the fortunes of the Charles Dickens magazine something more was needed from the pen of its conductor. By late December they, together with Forster, had persuaded him to begin a serialist story in the journal as soon as possible, even though, as he later told Lavinia Watson, he had intended to do nothing in that way for a year. Not for the first time, nor for the last, Dickens, confronted with a decline in the sales of a periodical for which he was responsible, turned to and began a serial story to save the day. But there was a difference between the situation with household words in late 1853 and either that with Master Humphrey's clock in 1840, or that with all the year round in 1860. In the two latter cases Dickens had already actually created, or at least conceived of, two central characters in a particular relationship, Nell and her grandfather, and what Forster calls the germ of Pip and McWitch, on whom he could build. But here the story had to be invented ab initio. The agreement drawn up by his household words partners on December 28 simply requires Dickens to write, as soon as possible, a story for household words equal in length to five single monthly numbers of Bleak House to be published in continuous weekly installments. For this he was to receive £1,000, which sum was to be kept quite apart from the magazine's regular accounts. The copyright was to remain solely and entirely his point five on the day his partners drew up this agreement Dickens, accompanied by Catherine and Georgina, was in Birmingham for the public readings from his Christmas books, The Carol and the Cricket that he had promised to give for the benefit of the new Birmingham and Midland Institute. This was the first occasion of his giving such readings and the first night had gone brilliantly. On the 28th he was taking a day off before further readings on the two following days. He made a solo rail excursion from Birmingham to Wolverhampton, observing from the train, always a wonderfully suggestive place to him when travelling alone. See above, P. 308, the industrial landscape covered by a heavy fall of snow. He used this as the basis for Fire and Snow, published in the January 21st issue of Household Words, into which he introduced some fairy tale imagery, clanking serpents. Writhing above coal pits, which he was to revisit in the story he was now committed to writing. The third night's reading was targeted at a working-class audience with tickets priced accordingly. Over 2,000 people attended. Before he read the Carol Dickens made a short speech in which he was interrupted at the first word by a perfect hurricane of applause so that he had to stop and begin again. He called for greater mutual understanding and cooperation between employers and employed and voiced the hope that these things would be promoted by improved educational opportunities for the workers educational of the feelings as well as of the reason, and a greater trustfulness towards the workers on the part of the employers. He then read virtually the entire text of the carol. This lasted three hours but his enraptured hearers, he told Lavinia Watson on January 13, lost nothing, misinterpreted nothing, followed everything closely, laughed and cried with writing for these times. 1853-1854 Most delightful earnestness, 
and animated me to that extent that I felt as if we were all bodily going up into the clouds together. Point six, his impassioned plea for greater understanding between workers and employers had a particular resonance in the winter of 1853 because of the bitter industrial dispute raging in the Lancashire industrial town of Preston since the previous summer. The workers in the cotton mills had demanded the restoration of the 10 per center of their wages cut American Samoa, they claimed, a temporary measure when trade was bad in 1847. The masters having rejected this, most of the workers had struck whereupon most masters had responded by closing their mills, thus locking out the entire workforce. Nothing stood between the workers and their families and outright starvation except the voluntary contributions sent in by their fellow workers in Blackburn and other industrial towns and distributed by a committee of the Preston Hands. The dispute had attained national importance, and attracted international interest also, Dickens had read reports in the Italian newspapers. Household Words carried an article entitled Locked Out in the Issue for December 10 in which the writer argued, as Dickens himself had done in Railway Strikes, H.W., 11 January 1851, that strikes generally resulted from disastrous ignorance on the part of the workers and meddling by professional political agitators and mob orators. At some point in early January, while he was enjoying the afterglow of his Birmingham triumph and busily organizing some private theatricals to be performed by his children on Twelfth Night, Dickens got the idea for his new story. Later, he was to tell Lavinia Watson, November 1, 1854, that the idea had laid hold of me by the throat in a very violent manner, implying that it was this sudden seizure rather than any commercial considerations that had led to the writing of this particular story. It seems more probable, as I have suggested that the idea occurred to him shortly after he had agreed to write the story, as a result of two things merging in his mind. The first was the urgent need, as most recently expressed in his Birmingham speech, for more inter-class cooperation, fusion. Without confusion, and the equally urgent need for setting in place a system of national education addressing the feelings as well as the reason, that should help to promote this. The second was his growing concern over the continuing grim news of the bitter worker-slash-employer conflict taking place in Preston. Point seven: The strict limits within which the new story was to be confined, one quarter the length of one of his monthly part novels, favoured the creation of a fable-like tale and Dickens evidently decided to use this fictional mode to demonstrate what he was sure would be the disastrous consequences, both for individuals and for society, of what he later called, when writing to Carlyle to ask permission to dedicate the book to him, a terrible mistake of these days. His reference here seems to be to the contemporary national obsession with the so-called science, the dismal science, Carlyle called it, of political economy, fueled as it was by a widespread faith in facts and figures, statistics and averages. As he saw it, this Charles Dickens was leading to the neglect of other vitally important, forms of education, especially those aimed at developing a child's emotional and imaginative life. Political economy pervaded the theories and practice of many leading educationalists, notably the pedagogic procedures inculcated at the new teacher training colleges which had been established in 1846 under the aegis of Sir James K. Shuttleworth a founding member of the Statistical Society in 1834, and the first Secretary of the Committee of Council on Education, 1839-49. On January 25 Dickens asked Wills to get him, for the story I am trying to hammer out, the Education Board's questions for the examination of school teachers. His decision to set the story in a northern industrial town was undoubtedly in response to what was happening in Preston, but may have been influenced also by the great success of Gaskell's Mary Barton in 1848, he was also planning to serialise in Household Words a second novel on which she was working, and for which he was eventually to supply the title, North and South. Perhaps he believed also that using this more circumscribed end, 
to most of his readers quite unfamiliar industrial setting would help to focus attention on his message. The tighter format of this serial, with its stripped-down narrative, sparseness of detail, and strong, rapidly sketched contrasts of scene and character, would also help to convey his meaning to the reader with great immediacy. Point eight on January 20, a Friday, always regarded by him as an auspicious day on which to begin any new enterprise, Dickens began planning the new story. He had already got the name Grad Grind, brilliantly combining the notion of grading or measuring with that of harsh mechanical process. He now jots down Mr. Grad Grind, followed by MRS Grad Grind, and then proceeds to list no fewer than 36 different possible titles for the story. As in the case of Bleak House and, later, Great Expectations, he wants a title relating to the central theme and meaning of the book rather than to its protagonist. He makes a short list of 13 titles, adds a new one, The Grad Grind Philosophy, and sends it to Forster, asking him to choose three. Hard Times one of the few suggestions that did not somehow refer to facts and figures, was one of the three Forster picked out. Dickens himself had also chosen three and since Hard Times was the only title common to his list and to Forster's, it became his final choice. The neatness of its dual reference to the hard-headedness, and, by extension, the hard-heartedness, of Grattrindian political scientists, and to the hardship of the workers lives in Coke Town makes it difficult to imagine a better choice. Point nine Dickens also planned out the new story in five monthly numbers each of which he then subdivided into four weekly installments consisting of one or two chapters. Each weekly installment would occupy five of the magazine's double column pages, give or take a paragraph or two. Seven and a half pages of his writing would, he calculated on January 20th be required to yield this amount of copy. As far as the mechanics of the thing went this was fine but his calculations concealed the real problem, namely that he had to present the writing for these times. 1853 to 1854 stories successive episodes, characters, setting, action, within five and a bit octavo pages rather than in the ampler space of the 32-page monthly number or even the twelve quarto pages of the weekly numbers of Master Humphrey's Clock. Not surprisingly, we find him, shortly after he had begun writing, complaining to Forster that he found the difficulty of space crushing. Nobody, he lamented, can have any idea of it who has not had an experience of patient fiction writing with some elbow room always, and open places in perspective. In the event, he rose magnificently to the new challenge and subsequently found that, when necessity demanded it, he could with comparative ease return to the weekly serialization mode in A Tale of Two Cities and, later, Great Expectations.10 Dickens's careful planning of hard times was not confined to the problem of weekly serialization. As he later told Carlyle, he also constructed it patiently with a view to its publication altogether in a compact cheap form, that is, as a single unillustrated volume to be priced at five shillings. Thus we find among his working notes for the second monthly number the following. Republish in three books. Slash one. Sewing slash two. Reaping slash three. Garnering. For the first time since Oliver Dickens follows Fielding in Tom Jones and Stern in Tristram Shandy, in dividing his novel into books, a practice he was to continue in all his subsequent completed novels. Unlike his 18th century predecessors, however, Dickens how gives his books titles, except in the case of Great Expectations where the divisions are called stages, and numbers his chapters consecutively throughout. In the case of Hard Times, the biblical echo in the book's titles points to the story's message that basing a whole educational system on a wholly secular and dehumanizing social theory must inevitably lead to dire results. The third title, Garnering, does suggest, however, that there will be some positive element in the story's ending. Something will be saved from the bad harvest, some good will result, even for Mr. Gradgrind.
He is no villain, after all, but simply a bigoted believer in a tragically mistaken theory. Point 11 On January 23 Dickens told Burdett Coutts he had written the first page of the new story. Five days later he made a weekend visit to Preston with Wills, partly to get some general background, and partly to report for his household words readers on the situation there. His resultant article, On Strike, Household Words, February 11, begins with Dickens encountering on the Preston train a forerunner of Mr. Bounderby, an overbearing opponent of the workers, whom Dickens mentally names Mr. Snapper. This allows him to make clear that he himself supports neither the masters nor the workers but is a concerned observer who wishes to be a friend to both. In Preston, where his presence and his luxuriant new mustaches were much commented upon by the local press, he walked about the streets, inspected the various placards, and briefly attended a meeting in which delegates from neighboring towns handed over the money raised by their fellow townsmen to support the striking Preston workers. I am Charles Dickens to view this image, please refer to the print version of this book. 34 Payment of the Operatives, in the Temperance Hall, Preston, Illustrated London News, November 12, 1853 Afraid I shall not be able to get much here, he wrote to Forster just before going to this meeting. It is a nasty place, I thought it was a model town, dot. The next day he attended another meeting at which the money was distributed. In On Strike he emphasized the quiet good order of the proceedings at both meetings, which was only briefly broken in the first one by the fiery oratory of one speaker, Mortimer Grimshaw, here called Gruff Shaw, who later modeled for Dickens's revolutionary agitator Slack Bridge. Finally, he describes a visit to one mill that had stayed open where those workers who had reported for duty resembled a few remaining leaves in a wintry forest. As this image suggests, On Strike is essentially an impressionistic piece of reportage, concerned to reassure his middle-class readers that the Preston strikers were nothing like the revolutionary, industrial town mobs he had once described in the old curiosity shop. Dickens does not examine the arguments for and against the strike. For him it is simply a deplorable calamity for all those directly concerned, and for the nation at large, and the only way for it to be satisfactorily settled was by means of some authorized mediation and explanation. Point 12 The figure most fully described and most extensively reported in On Strike is the chairman of the first meeting, George Cowell. Dickens depicts him as an impressive-looking, calm, quietly-spoken man with a placid attentive face and a persuasive action of his right arm. His Lancashire dialect is sensitively reproduced and Dickens recalls it later when writing dialogue for the Coke town worker Stephen Blackpool. Hapless, confused Stephen, destined to martyrdom writing for these times. 1853-1854 as his name suggests is not, however, modelled on George Cowell in the way that Slackbridge clearly is on Mortimer Grimshaw. The latter was a local man, mentioned only briefly in the article. In hard times, however, he appears as a rabble-rousing outsider, an emissary of the United Aggregate Tribunal, whose rant fills several columns of household words in the 11th weekly installment of the serial, BK2, CH. 4 in the volume edition. The absence from the novel of a Cowell figure shows Dickens's fictional purposes were somewhat different from his journalistic ones. Unlike the Preston workers, the Coke Town ones are unionist and they do not go on strike. Dickens had to reassure Gaskell, who was planning to include a strike in her new story for his journal, that she need not worry about his preempting her in this respect. Hard Times is primarily concerned with educational matters and the need for inter-class understanding and cooperation and Dickens did not want it to be too narrowly related to the Preston strike in readers' minds but rather to be understood as having a much wider application to the contemporary condition of England. Point 13 Hence his annoyance with household words contributor Peter Cunningham when, in the Illustrated London News for March 4, the same day that Hard Times was first advertised in. Dickens's journal, 
Cunningham chattily informed his readers that Dickens's recent inquiry into the Preston strike is said to have originated the title of the new tale, and, in some respects, suggested the turn of the story. Writing privately to Cunningham on March 11, Dickens told him he was altogether wrong and that the title was many weeks old, and chapters of the story were written, before I went to Preston or thought about the present strike. This was certainly stretching the truth but does not affect the main ground of Dickens's complaint which he expressed as follows. The mischief of such a statement is twofold. First, it encourages the public to believe in the impossibility that books are produced in that very sudden and cavalier manner. And secondly in this instance it has this pernicious bearing. It localizes, so far as your readers are concerned, a story which has a direct purpose in reference to the working people all over England, and it will cause, as I know by former experience, characters to be fitted on to individuals whom I never saw or heard of in my life. Many years later, advising the actor-manager Charles Fector on producing a dramatic adaptation of Gaskell's Mary Barton, Dickens recommended using a fictitious name for the setting instead of the real one, Manchester. When I did hard times, he wrote, for September. 1866, I called the scene Coketown. Everybody knew what was meant but every cotton-spinning town said it was the other cotton-spinning town. During February and early March Dickens was, as he expressed it to Burdett Coutts, cracking my head over the new story. By March 7 he had managed to Charles Dickens complete the first five chapters, enough copy for the first two weekly installments. They bring the story to the point at which Mr. Sleary and his circus troupe are about to enter. Dickens had asked Lemon to send him any slang terms among tumblers and circus people that he could think of, to supplement those he himself had already noted down. The reader has already met Grad Grind and his family, McCocum Child the fact-grinding schoolmaster, wittily presented as a character out of the Arabian Nights, and the self-vaunted self-made man Josiah Bounderby.14 During March Dickens wrote only one piece for household words, a warm tribute to his old friend Talford which appeared in the March 25th issue. Talford had died very suddenly at the Stafford Assizes on March 13 whilst in the midst of his charge to the jury. With his last breath he feelingly deplored the want of sympathy which existed between the higher and lower classes. This chimed perfectly with Dickens's most urgent concerns in hard times who, he wrote, knowing England at this time, would wish to utter with his last breath a more righteous warning than that its curse is ignorance, or a miscalled education which is as bad or worse, and a want of the exchange of innumerable graces and sympathies among the various orders of society, each hardened unto each and holding itself aloof, fifteen Dickens greatly feared, and with good reason, that both politicians and people would be distracted from problems at home by the Crimean War which began in March though he believed the Emperor of Russia was a dangerous tyrant who had to be stopped. Some months into the war, on November 1, he wrote to Lavinia Watson that he felt something like despair to see how the old cannon smoke and blood mist obscure the wrongs and sufferings of the people at home. It was all the more imperative, therefore, that he should get the message of hard times across to as wide a readership as possible. The first installment of the story, comprising the first three chapters, appeared in the issue dated April 1, 1854. Dickens's name was given as author and there were no chapter titles nor, of course, any illustrations. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.